So good morning, guys. Today, we are going to be continuing our wonderful exploration of heat transfer. With last time we've been looking at heat transfer as a seed with transient conduction, which we will most likely finish today. And we will get into some discussions on convection, which will be finished on Friday. So from last time, from our discussions of transient heat conduction, we had looked at two cases. The first was for what's known as a lumped system analysis. which states that for a given system, if the B out number, which is approximately H times the characteristic length over thermal conductivity is below 0.1, this lump system can apply given our characteristic length is the volume of the object over our surface area, All right? So we're looking at the rate, relative rates of convection and conduction. And for systems when it's limited by convection on the surface, we can consider the system a lump system such that we can find the temperature of the system with respect to time by this function, T minus T infinity over T naught minus T infinity is equal to E to the negative BT, where B is equal to H over rho CP L sub C. And we found a dead guy yes on Monday, and we guessed what the time of death was. Even though LCA didn't apply, and even though he didn't look like a cylinder, we didn't have our glasses, and so we made assumptions, because we're good engineers. Now to, and right at the end of class, I threw a bunch of differential equations at you associated with one dimensional transient conduction. Which given these systems, we had to consider that heat transfer is going to be occurring um, on the surface as well as within the objects such that we have to I consider a term known as thermal diffusivity. Which is equal to the thermal conductivity of an object over rho times Cp. And thermal diffusivity was the ability of a substance to diffuse thermal energy within itself. And with that in mind, we had developed an initial expression for what's known as a one dimensional slab which stated that the surface temperature minus the temperature at position X, so X sub T, I could say, over the surface temperature minus T A is equal to four over pi over E to the negative A1 F O sine of pi X over two S plus one third E to the negative nine A1 F O sine of what is it, three pi x over two s plus dot dot dot. There was a third term, but it's in your book for those that really wanna know. Maybe it's page 310, equation 1019. The important thing to identify is mainly a one, it's just a constant pi over two squared, which I believe is simply 2.467. Okay, and apparently some of this disappeared. S 
is one half the slab thickness. And FO is our Fourier number, which is the ability or comparison of a material's ability to diffuse heat as compared to its ability to store heat or store energy. And there are expressions for not only slabs, but for cylinders and spheres. And the text also discusses equations for not just the temperature at position X and T, but also the average temperature. Of a slab which gives you another series solution here. I'll zoom out so that you can see a little more of this all at once. Or TS minus TB is the average over TS minus T. So A equals eight over pi squared times E to the negative A1FO plus one ninth e to the negative nine A1FO plus one twenty-fifth e to the negative twenty-five a one f o. This is equation ten twenty on page three ten. And so what it means is there's a lot of series solutions that we have for these assumptions associated with one-dimensional heat transfer as it applies to transient conduction. However, there is a slightly simpler way to analyze these systems, and that's through the use of some graphs, which we'll talk about. This is the first one we'll talk about for now, which basically compares the Fourier number on the x-axis with the temperature ratio associated with the average temperature within the object for a slab, a cylinder, and a sphere. So in this case, to find the average temperature of an object at a particular time, you calculate the Fourier number based on that time, and then look for the y-intersection with the curves to solve for your temperature. Keeping in mind the Fourier number, is alpha times time divided by S squared, which I probably didn't put in the notes, and I should have. So let's look at an example of applying this one dimensional system to a heat transfer problem. So for this, we have an eight centimeter thick slab of porous ceramic initially at 90 degrees Celsius is being cooled by, from both sides by water that holds the surface temperature of the slab constant at 30 degrees Celsius. If the properties of the ceramic are shown here, with the density of 1,025 kilograms per cubic meter, a heat capacity of 800 joules per kilogram Kelvin, and a thermal conductivity of 1.8 watts per meter Kelvin. What is the temperature at the center of the slab and halfway from the surface to the center after three minutes? And what is the average temperature of the slab itself after three minutes? All right, so let's take a look at this example together. So 
So we have cooling, a ceramic slab. So this slab initially looks like this. The thickness is eight centimeters or 0 0.08 meters. Temperature on the surface is 30 degrees Celsius. T naught in the center is 90 degrees Celsius. And the properties as provided, the density is 1,025 kilograms per cubic meter. The heat capacity is approximately 800 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And the thermal conductivity is 1.8 watts per meter Kelvin. So we're looking at what is T when little t a time is three minutes or 180 seconds and X is both S for the center and one half S for halfway from the surface to the center. And so for this, we're going to be looking and using equation 1019 here to solve for this, these temperatures. So some of the things that we need to figure out are S, A, and the Fourier number. So to find these, I need alpha, which is K over rho CP, or 1.8 divided by 1,025 divided by 800, which gives me a thermal diffusivity of approximately 2.14 times 10 to the minus six meters per second squared per second. Next, I can find S, which is when I have the thickness. If the thickness is eight centimeters, half of that is four centimeters or 0.04 meters. A1, I've already stated, is pi over two squared, which is approximately 2.467, which means our Fourier number, which is alpha T over S squared, is 2.14 times 10 to the minus six meter squared per second times 180 seconds divided by S squared or 0.04 squared, which gives it for a number as a dimensionless value of approximately 0 0.241. So with that, I have everything I need to plug in to my large series solution. So I have A1, I have FO, I have X and S. So let's look at the center temperature. So T equals what when X equals S? Well, I'm looking for TS minus T over TS minus A, T sub A I believe, equals four over pi times the stuff. For the sake of time, I'm not going to write it all out, but I will tell you that doing the calculation gives you a value of approximately 0.701. So what that means is in solving for the temperature, I have 30 degrees minus T over 30 degrees minus 90 degrees equals 0.701. Solving this value, I get a temperature of approximately 72 degrees for the center of the slab. The next temperature I'm looking for is when X equals 1 half S Or 0 0.02, this was 0 0.04 meters. And so in this case, solving for this, I get a value of approximately 0 
which plugging in the values gives me a temperature of approximately 60 degrees Celsius. So after three minutes, the center temperature has fallen to 972 degrees, and halfway from the surface to the center shows 60 degrees. Where did you get the values for um, like the point uh, 701 and the point 498? That's by solving this equation here. It's solving the okay. right hand side. I'm okay. just not going to do it because it takes like five, 10 minutes just to write it out. Got it. And we only have 15 minutes. You're welcome to okay. do it. And if you want to have further questions, you can shoot me emails. But yeah, I'm just kind not. of showing you the process. Because at that point, it's just a bunch of plug and chug. Understood. No problem. It's, it's, it's a good question, and that's a fair question. So the last question asks is, what is the average temperature? which is given as TB bar at T equals three minutes. Well, for that, we need equation 1020, which says TS minus TB bar over TS minus TA equals a bunch of stuff again. I think I showed it up here, this one. And so plugging in, it's the same values that I need. Plugging in, you should get a value of approximately 0 0.45, which implies that that average temperature throughout the slab is somewhere on the order of 57 degrees, which is about what you would expect, given that the temperature between the slab and the surface, the center and the surface is 60 your average will, will be about that. Another way you can look at and find the average temperature if you didn't want to solve the extremely confusing portion of the equation 1020, you can use the figure here for Fourier number, where we found the Fourier number earlier when T is 180 degrees. I believe we said it was what was it, 0.241, so about 0 0.24, 0 0.25. If you find the intersection between that and the slab line, we get what? What page is that on? This figure is on page 311. we get a value of about 0.45, which is what I said earlier. And so you get a value of 0.45, then you can solve based off the known temperatures for the average temperature. It's just a little less accurate than the other way. So when you use those equations you gave us, like the one for the 1D slab has like a simplified to two terms, but the one you gave us for the average temperature of the slab has three terms. Do you always want us to do it like that or like two for both? It's really up to you. Typically the first two terms are accurate enough, but it's, 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 that's just the nature of series solutions, right? You guys, for, for the, we've been in multi-comp. You know, the, the first two terms are the most important. The third term may give you a little bit more accuracy, but definitely no more than the, those first three terms, which is why they're only provided. If, if you're doing it on a homework and you're, you know, you're plugging in Excel, go ahead and do the three terms. It's, it's only in cases when you're time limited or resource limited that you can, you can cut that corner, but that's a fair question. I, I, I did admittedly only write the first two terms on that one. So fair, fair point. Any other questions on the one dimensional approximations and this example? I know I cut off the quote unquote hard part of it because it was really just a lot of math, 
and this isn't a math class. It's a fun with numbers that aren't numbers class. All right. So one thing that we have to note is that, making sure I'm sharing the right thing, because I'm probably not. Um, these one dimensional approximations that we've developed only applies when the surface temperature is constant. Now, when the surface temperature isn't constant, that means we have other systems or situations occurring. All right, so when the surface temperature is not constant or isn't constant, you have to consider heat transfer. That occurs on the surface. Right, and so once again, we have to consider the heat transfer that occurs from the surface to the surroundings as compared to the surface with itself. And so what number did we have to look at that comparison? The B out number. The B out number. And so what we find is the temperature profiles, T sub X of T, now becomes a function of both the Fourier number and the B out number. And so the way we do this is through known, which is what's known as the Heisler charts. And for an example of the Heisler charts, I can show you in this. Lots of fun. So there's charts for depend for lots of regular shapes. There isn't any for, for irregular shapes, but what we find is for a given Fourier number, which is here, it's tau in this text that I, I like, as well as a given inverse B out number, we see that it corresponds to a dimensionless temperature, which we have here. And so what you look for is given a Fourier number and a B out number, you find the intersection between those two, and it gives you an, ex an estimation of the dimensionless temperature. Now, on the, in the course module, I did um, provide a lengthier discussion on Heisler charts. I don't really talk about them a whole lot in class. However, I think they're valuable in the more real cases where the surface temperature will not be constant. It's a little, it looks complicated, but in reality, it's just, once again, finding two out of the three, what you're looking for, and then backing out the third missing variable. And you should see it here, it's, it's taken from Sangal's text, looking at transient conduction. Here, I'll share it with you. I was able to pull it up. It's, it's really good kind of overview of, of how they dimensionalize essentially temperature, heat transfer, and time. And you see kind of the expressions that come up out of it that you really don't want to solve. And so, like I said, it's better instead of using some of this other stuff to stick with the B out numbers. And so there's a middle temperature. There's also temperature with respect to X, as well as, you know, a, a comparison of heat transfer. And this provided for plates, cylinders, and I believe spheres. And you should have a homework problem kind of, you know, using these Heisler charts. Where did you say we could find these Heisler charts again? Um, this PDF that I'm showing you kind of now is in the course modules on Blackboard. I just basically extracted this section from the text, this textbook that's not our textbook, and I uploaded it uh, in Blackboard. It should say like Heisler chart information. So go ahead and give this a skim, and you'll be using this to solve a homework problem using a Heisler charts. So the last things I want to discuss as it relates to transient conduction are cases of what's known as a semi-infinite solid. And 
And so what in these cases, what we're looking at is an object so large that the heat transfer that occurs can be approximated only to a small surface region within that given object. A good example of this is the Earth, primarily because when we're, we, we're looking at temperature fluctuations that occur on the surface and within the Earth, we can consider it a semi-infinite solid and in such that what we, we often consider is what's known as the penetration depth that may occur in a heat transfer situation. For example, if we have an oil pipeline, we know that that oil is going to be highly dependent in terms of temperature on its viscosity as it relates to its ability to flow over long distances. And so what might be beneficial to know if, if let's say you're working for a petrochemical company or, or some sort of process com company building pipelines, you would probably want to know how deep that pipe needs to be such that you can neglect any temperature fluctuations that can occur associated with the weather, right? Because if you have a giant cold snap, you really don't want that to affect your pipeline operation because having a, you know, control and correct for that pre presents a, a very difficult situation in terms of process management. And so what we can solve for is what's known as the penetration depth, as well as get an idea of the temperature profile as a function of depth within one of these systems. And so with some mathematics, you can identify the temperature, once again, in any position or depth and time over an initial temperature, E sub A, S being the you know, surface temperature, as this value here, two over the square root of pi, times the integral of zero to C, E to the negative C squared, DC. Where Z, is equal to x over 2 times the square root of alpha times t. And so what we find is, I think it's on page 319, we find a figure that relates z to this temperature here, which if I call it theta, you'll see it relates to theta. And these go from zero to two, and this goes from zero to one. And there's a, simply a curve that relates this dimensionless distance and time with the dimensionless temperature, such that for any given temperature, and depth, you can find the time, or based on a depth and time, you can find the temperature and the temperature profile. And we can also solve for what's known as penetration depth, or essentially for a given temperature fluctuation, how deep does that influence the semi-infinite solid? X of P, which is equal to 3.64 times the square root of alpha T which, like I said, for the situations in which you're interested in figuring, you know, what's the penetration depth of a temperature fluctuation, you can solve for it based off of thermal diffusivity and the estimated time that that issue would occur. And so just to kind of give you an example of this, we have here, let's look at this one, which states for this example, we have a cold front dropping the air temperature to negative 20 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. If the ground was initially at five degrees Celsius, how deep would a water pipeline have to be 
buried to avoid the danger of freezing. And under those conditions, what is the penetration depth? So what we're looking for in this case is given that surface temperature, the initial temperature, and essentially how deep or we're looking for is X given this system where the temperature you know, T sub X sub T would be set at zero. So I think this is probably a good example to have you guys spend a few minutes working in some breakouts. So go ahead and work in, in breakouts. See if you can find, solve for the minimum depth that you wanna have that pipeline, as well as the expected penetration depth. Hey, Dr. Lopez. I don't think any of us were quick enough on the draw. We didn't quite get that uh, thermal diffusivity. No, that's fine. I'm still trying to figure out a way that I could send those information to you guys and it doesn't just disappear. Right. It's, it's 0. 0.0011 meters squared per hour. Understood. Thank you. No problem. You. Sorry. It's work in progress. <laughs> that's all right. If, here, I'll just write it down for you now. It's weird that you can't like send a chat to everyone or something. I'm sure there is. There's probably just a stupid setting, right? You got to click this, put the semicolon here, double slash there, and that <laughs> works. That's just sounds about right. All right, I'll send. Uh, you have that now. Hopefully, I'll, you'll see another one here in a second. All right. Good luck.
Hey. Um, somebody was saying that you chatted in K values. Yeah, I didn't see the K value he sent out. Did you happen to see? It? Okay, there it is. Cool. There we Thank go. you. Thank you. Getting X of about 14.3. Oh, he changed the alpha on us. Dang. Oh, wait, where'd that message go? It disappeared. See, that's what that one's in the chat. Yeah, so. this one we can actually see. 0. 0.00. 0. Dr. Lopez? Yes. Um, when you solve for the integral and the z says like x over alpha t, is that a different x than um, xp or is it the same? It's the same z. So you can solve it by just using that 3.66 square root. You can solve for the penetration distance that way, yes. Did the alpha change? I thought it was 0 0.022. Did I broadcast so to two? I think the first one, right? Randy? It should yeah. be 0 0.0011. I'm sorry. Okay. 0.0011, okay. It should be 0 0.0011. I just hit the wrong thing. It's okay. I'll give you guys some more time to work. How's it going? Just giving everybody some of the values, making sure you have them. Yeah, yeah I was about to ask about alpha. Yeah, because I broadcast the message, but then it didn't like stay up. I wish I knew why.
So I have an answer. Not sure if it's the answer, though. Better than nothing. Yeah, this one is a little tricky if you don't have your book. I will be honest. Just, just going to check it real quick. Um, it's something around 19 and a half meters. No. No. Okay. Good guess. But no. All right, let's all look at this together. All right. So let's take a look at this problem together. Switch pens. So for this example, we're looking at water pipeline. And in this instance, we have essentially the ground, a pipeline that's got water in it. And initially, it's at five degrees Celsius. But then a cold snap happens that makes the temperature negative 20 degrees for 48 hours. I don't want to be there. And we're trying to figure out what's the minimum depth to avoid essentially T here at that depth to be zero degrees because if it gets to zero degrees, the water will start to freeze and your pipe will break. Nobody wants that. So the equation we have is T minus T sub S minus T over T sub S minus T sub A equals two over the square root of pi integral from zero to Z e to the negative z squared dc. So solving for the left-hand side, which is that theta, I should say theta is equal to negative 20 degrees minus zero degrees over negative 20 degrees minus five degrees Celsius. which I solve for this and I get a value of approximately 0.8 for my theta. Now you can, if you want to solve the equation and solve for Z or in a much easier way, go to that chart I mentioned to find Z. So we know theta here is 0.8 which this is the line for point eight, which means our Z is going to be here, or approximately point nine. So from my figure, Z is approximately 0 0.9, which equals, as I've stated you earlier, X to go over. back to the notes. Oh, thank you x over two times the square root of alpha times t. Alpha, I tried to give you 0 0.0011 meter squared per hour. T was 48 hours. So therefore, x equals z, which is 0 0.9 times two times the square root of alpha 0 0.0011 meter squared per hour times t, which is 48 hours, which gives you a depth of about, I keep moving, 0.42 meters. So that essentially means you need to have it at least be, I would probably say half a meter, call it good engineering for safety, to avoid it freezing during the snap. To find the total penetration depth, x of p, that's simply applying that 3.64 times the square root of alpha t, which is 3.64 times the square root of 0 0.0011 meter squared per hour times 48 hours. So the total penetration depth will be about 0.84 meters. Wait, does the time need to be in hours or seconds? Uh, 
I gave you alpha in hours, so the time needs to be in hours. Okay, that was where I messed up. Thank you. No problem. It happens. So, like I said, this one, uh, you need that book. Um, I'll, I don't think in my original lecture slide I gave you that, that image. Or, so I will re-upload lecture 14 so you guys have that figure. You'll probably need it for, I think, one of the homeworks. Dr. Lopez, just yes. to clarify, is the time included in that square root for that yes. test part there? Yes, okay. thank you. Yeah, because basically meter squared per hour times hour makes meter squared. The square root of meter squared is just meters. The units usually tell you what you need to do. All right, any questions on that? I think that wraps up what we have for transient conduction. Could you explain one more time what the significance of um, X of P is? X of P is essentially, let me go back to the figure, the penetration depth, or essentially this, where Z is about 0.99, it's essentially the, the depth where the temperature fluctuations or influence that occurs on the surface starts to influence that. It basically tells you for a given surface temperature after a given time, that's how far you'll, you'll start to see the effects of heat transfer in that solid. So depending for systems that are extremely sensitive to temperature fluctuations, you want any, you would, you would probably consider identifying, well, what's that, you know, maximum penetration distance, right? Which is what that, this X of P gives you. All right, any other questions? All right, hopefully that'll help you get through a few of those homework problems. Uh, we will do our discussion on convective heat transfer on Friday. And if not, take care guys, have a great day, and I will see you all on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys.